episode tonight. This will be our 40th uh, lesson in the book of Amos. It's been, you might say, a stern book, but you don't want to draw back from that. You want to read, when you're exposed to some words of God like this, you want to resolve, by God's grace, never to have an impact on God that makes him your adversary. Yes, that's right. And you can't, God can become your adversary. Yes. You definitely want him to be for you. Amen. <laughs> Not against you. So we're being expressed now <clears throat> to a facet of the divine nature that we do well to take heed to it, and particularly in these responses of uh, Amos to some of the things God said he was going to do, and he's, Amos steps up in the gap. And what is uh, what are you seeing in this is something Habakkuk referred to it <clears throat> in one of his prayers where God had told him he was going to really lay it on Israel. And here's what Habakkuk prayed. He said, I've heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years, in the midst of the years make known in wrath. Remember mercy. All right, that, that's what we're reading about now in, in Amos. That's what we're reading about. After recounting how God is, was powerfully revealed in his wrath, Habakkuk gave this one great expression after that. He said, although the fig tree shall not blossom. See, these are things like happen during times of chasing. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olives shall fail. And the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there'll be no herd in the stalls. Yet, yet, yeah. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. <laughs> yet. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'll tell you, you want to get the yet yeah. Amen. Yeah. into your life. Amen. He knew that faith is never in vain. I'm not yeah. going to quit believing. I'm not yeah. going to quit trusting. I'm not going to quit rejoicing, even though all this stuff's coming. Yeah. You can count on me, Lord. Now, that's the kind of person you want to have praying for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's the kind of person you want to stand in the gap. <clears throat> now, actually, God had hinted that this, he wasn't going to make a thorough destruction of Israel. He did it through, through Amos himself. He, first, he told Amos, he says, I'm not going to to turn away the punishment thereof. I'm, I'm going through with this, Amos. Yeah. Israel has provoked me, and I'm not going to just smother it. But he wasn't going to totally destroy him either. And he told that to Jeremiah. He said, it's 120 years after Amos. He said to Jeremiah, Thus saith the Lord, the whole land should be desolate. Yet will I not make a full end. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, that the hope, you know, hope wakes up. Who is it here? I'm not going to make a full end. In other words, there will be a remnant. There will be a remnant. Now in his spirit, Amos has sensed this. How clear it was, I, I don't know how clear it was, but he sensed this, and just sensing some things can make you pretty smart in the kingdom of God. Amen. He sensed it, so he begins to pray. In effect, for God to remember, in wrath, to remember mercy. That's, in fact, what he's, what he's praying for. And it seems to me that this is the kind of prayer that needs to be prayed in our time. Amen. We are living, if you don't think the falling away is great, well, you just, you need to get a little more perceptive. 
we are living in a tremendous falling away in which it's almost impossible to find a cluster of people that don't have to be rebuked. It, actually, this kind of started early on, and even in the even in the scriptural times, the, the necessity for rebuke started out. There seemed to have been a decline that almost immediately commenced, so that midway through the first century, and then later Jesus talked to the seven to seven churches in Asia, and he had to soundly rebuke five of them. Boy, they were they were really something had happened. Yeah. What had happened? Well, a serpent was loose. That's what had happened. Amen. And God was trying the faith of the saints through it. So when we see this, we already know what God thinks about insincere religion or lukewarmness or tolerating false teaching. We all, God's went on record now how this affects him. So it seems to me this is the time to say in wrath, remember mercy. Yes, amen. Yeah. It's just good to do it. Yeah. Now let's get, uh, get it into our text here. In the seventh chapter, verses four through six. Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, the Lord God called to contend by fire. And it devoured the great deep and did eat up a part. Then said I, O Lord, cease, <clears throat> cease, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob arise, for he is small? The Lord repented for this. This also shall not be, saith the Lord God. <clears throat> This is the second of three visions that's going to be in this chapter. Now, these are visions of what God intended to do. They hadn't been done yet. They hadn't been done yet. But he showed. God already told through Amos, he said, the Lord won't do anything except he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Yeah. Yeah. Even he's going to destroy Sodom. He oh, close, close Abraham. It tells, tells Abraham about it. Mm -hmm. He won't do anything. When he's going to chase Israel, he alerts the prophet, tell the people what I'm going to do. So he doesn't do anything except he reveals his secret to the prophets first. Why? Because the prophets can stand in the gap. Yeah, amen. Yeah. There comes a time when the people are so dead, nothing can come from them. Yeah. Somebody else has got to step in. Yeah. If they don't, the people are going to perish. That's the kind of state we're in. Somebody with understanding has to step up and represent the dead masses. Yeah. You're not going to get anything out of them because they don't see enough. They're not sensitive enough. They're, I'm talking about church folk now. They're too far from God. They can't hear God. They can't understand God. What are you going to do? Well, you just can't stand there and let them go to hell. That's not, that's not a sufficient posture. God let you see it so you could step in the gap. Amen. That's right. And that's what, uh, <laughs> that's what Amos is doing. The Lord showed me. He said, the Lord showed me. Now, how would you like, how would you like if that's just what the Lord showed you? Some of these prophets, this is about the only thing they saw yeah. was doom and destruction. Amen. Few prophets were given <laughs> to see the glories of the new covenant era, but a lot of prophets, this was what, this is what the message they were given. See, you can't be choosy about what the Lord gives you. So this is a divine manner. See, the Lord, early on when he revealed to Moses, more than he'd ever revealed to anybody before Moses, Moses, after he, after everybody was scared half to death at Mount Sinai and told Moses, you speak with us. We don't want to have any more of the people shaking and fearing. Even Moses said, I exceedingly fear and quake. And the rest of the people speak no more. And at that time, Moses said, show me thy glory. I want to see more. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And so God showed him more. And he declared himself. He told Moses to my knowledge, he didn't tell anybody else this before Moses. And this now we're, 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 
about 2,500 years into the history of the world. And he had not made this known to anybody else so far as I know, not to this extent. And the first things he said about himself to Moses was that he was full of mercy, graciousness, and long-suffering. That's the first thing he said. That's not the only thing he said, but that's the first thing. First thing he said. Then, of course, he added that he, was, would, he couldn't acquit the guilt. He just couldn't, like, ignore sin. Yeah. They couldn't just, like, brush it aside. He did have to do something about sin. Well, who could have thought of what to do like he did? He thought of a way to take all the sins of the world and lay it on one man and make that man pay the penalty. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Then he could do something about the situation. Amen. See, God does have, he is merciful and gracious and long-suffering, abundant in good, goodness, goodness and truth. He is. He also has wrath and indignation, will not acquit the guilty. But these ver these these traits don't contend with each other. There has to be a reason for him to express any of these. God is above all, his prevailing trait is he's righteous. He will not do anything that is unrighteous. And it's unrighteous for God to just ignore sin. Or it's unrighteous for God just to ignore him that does, does good. <laughs> He's it's unrighteous. Though he has something has to summon if he wants to be gracious, something has to summon forth the graciousness. So there has to be a, something to cause it to, to surface. And what we're seeing is Amos is that's, what he, that's the role he's playing. It's because of him that this is going to surface. <clears throat> now, what did, uh, see, let me say this also. It's not enough just to need grace. The fact that you need grace doesn't mean you get grace. Mm -hmm. if, if, all, if all it would took for to get grace was to need grace, then you don't need Jesus, you don't need an intercessor, you don't need grace. But see, needing grace isn't enough. There has to be a reason. For God to give you grace, there has to be a reason. Now God, uh, he divulges to Amos. He didn't make this an announcement to everybody. He said, um, the Lord called to contend by fire. The Lord called, called, the Lord called. Other versions said the Lord was calling or the Lord sent for, or he was summoning and preparing now, God's the only one that can just call for something to happen. Just right. calls for it. Now, we're introduced to God in this capacity in the beginning. God just called for things. Yeah, right. He said, let there be light. Yeah. Let there be a firmament. Let the waters above be gathered in one place. Let the earth bring forth grass. Let the, there be lights in the firmament. Let the waters bring forth the bunny. Let the earth bring forth cheese. He just called, just calling them forth. Yeah. How do we account for their existence? God called them forth. Uh -huh. No one's going to get grace till God calls it forth. Amen. Amen. And if He does, they're going to get it. Yeah. So that's what Amos, in a way, is doing. He's, he's asking for God to call forth some mm -hmm. grace, call forth some long suffering, mm -hmm. call forth, call forth. <laughs> That's what taking place in our text. I like uh, how the psalmist put it, Psalm 33, 9. For he spake, yeah. and it was done. Amen. He uttered, and it stood fast. That's God for you. In Haggai's day, he called for a drought. <laughs> Joseph's day called for a famine. See, this is we're talking about God now. We got to see this about God. This makes all the difference in the world how you pray. Amen. Makes all the difference how you live. Amen. If we see that God could just call it forth. Amen. Enemies look different when you could have a God that can just call it forth. 
The word contend means to strive with or complain or quarrel. He's going to, he's having an argument with Israel, or Israel's having an argument with him. So he's going to call for some fire to enter into the argument. That's going to change now, it's going to change the argument from the other side. Call for a fire, contend by fire. See, their lives, Israel's lives, had become an argument against God. Their lives were a living argument against God. Now, I know people don't know this, but then this is the job of the church is to let people know this. They, they're the pillar and ground of the truth. They are to uh, pass on to people the knowledge of God, what God's like, what God expects, what God has to give. Stop solving people's problems. That's not what you're here for. We already got a problem solver. Amen. You got to get reconciled to this problem solver. Amen. Now, we're ministers to need, but I'm talking about problem solvers. I'm not talking about ministers to needs of people. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the, there's a lot of people that got rich. Religious people are rich because they help people solve their problems. The last going rate's about $160 an hour. Oh, oh boy, I would hate to face God. See, I help people with their problems. I only charge them $160 an hour. I'm talking about church folk. I'm not Christian people. See, once a person's been arguing with God, a person's living in sin is arguing with God. So the, pro, the, the, the thing that we're faced with is not correcting this person's behavior. It's to get God into this situation. Amen. That's what has to be with God. We've got to get God into this situation. He's not going to get into it because of them. But he will because of you. Yeah. If a man sees his brother sin, a sinner, a son, and a death, and shall ask, God will give him life because of the one that asked. Amen. See? That's, this is how God is. It's how sensitive of God is. You got people you know that you could ask them to do this and ask them to do that, and they won't do it because you're the one that asked them. Now you can go to God yeah. and stand in the gap. Amen. Right. I imagine a lot of people stood in the gap for Saul of Tarsus. We don't, right. It doesn't say anything about it, but I imagine there's a lot of folk yeah. prayed for him. Now he said, uh, I'm going to call to contend with fire. All right, this is a little more serious than, than a plague of locusts. Remember the first, I'm going to send locusts. All right, this is, a little more, this is a little more potent, more severe judgment. God had turned from his intention. Remember yet, Amos stepped up and said, forgive, Lord, forgive. God said, oh, I won't do this. That's what he told him. Now, I don't know how much time had passed, but now this surfaces again, and he says, I'm going to use fire this time. I'm going to plead with them with fire. I'm going to exert some pressure on them with fire, consuming fire. What kind of, I'm going to plead with them with fire. Isaiah 3.13 says, I'm going to plead and judge his people. Ezekiel 38, 22 says, I'll, I'm going to plead against them with fire. I'm going to try and change their minds. I speak as a man, understand, by heating things up. Now, it's a fire was so great, it devoured the deep, it says. It devoured the deep. The, the sea, he's talking about the sea. It was such a potent fire that he's purposing. Now the Mediterranean Sea was the sea, just to the just to the west of Israel was the Mediterranean Sea, and what he says is this fire so it'll dry up the Mediterranean. Yeah. Remember that fire fell from heaven, licked up all the water in the trenches of. Yes, that's right. This is going to lick up all the water around about that kind of fire, boy. How are you going to survive something like that? That's what I purpose to do. He told Amos. That's what I purpose to do, and the fire that eat up a part as it got over into the land and. Yeah. 
consumed part of the land that had already been ravaged by locusts. So it's unparalleled destructive yeah. judgment. See, there's some judgment that like, comes like it's chastening. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can survive it. If you wake up, you can survive it. Then there's other, it's just, it's just bad. It's, yeah. it's like fire falls down and burns up a bunch of people and the ground opens up and swallows up a couple hundred yeah. people. And right. there's, there's judgments like that, see? So that's, that's the kind of category this is in. See, there are manners that provoke God because God has this trait. He can't acquit the guilty. He's, he's going he's to hold sinners accountable to the third and fourth generation, is what he said. And they've awakened that. They've awakened that part of his, that part of his nature. Even though he is merciful, gracious, and long-suffering, see? But this has awakened this other... It's other part of him. So now he is telling Amos this because he doesn't prefer. God doesn't prefer to destroy. He doesn't prefer to judge. He prefers to save and to exonerate. That's what he prefers to do. But he's got to have somebody with understanding appeal to this so that for their sake he'll grace will surface so Amos he's right he's right on this as soon as God tells him this then said I Lord God cease he said people wouldn't have the courage to say that this is faith talking see this because he knows what he knows God is merciful gracious and long suffering he's revealed that he's merciful gracious and long suffering so that he knows that so now he's he's using that the, he's using it, calling for these traits to surface. Now, this is the second judgment that he pronounced against Israel. It's something he's purposed. It's not like his eternal purpose. See, there's two ways God purposes. There's purposes, it, intentions that he w can alter. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. There's others that he doesn't, can't alter. Uh -huh. Blessed is the person who can distinguish between the two. Yeah. And notice when he says, Oh Lord God, boy, that's on that must have been music up in heaven. Yeah. Listen to that. Oh Lord God. That's the second time Amos has addressed the Lord that way. The seventh chapter, verse two, he said the same thing. Oh Lord God, that expression, Lord God, is mentioned twenty-two times in Amos. Twenty-two times. It's an expression that's just it's not just a formal address like Mr. Jones. Or president so and so. It's not just a formal. It's an insightful expression. It's mentioned in the totality of Scripture 540 times. Lord God. Now this is the rudimentary view of God. This is uh, this is beginner's stuff. This is some of the first things you learn about God. His accents, his mastery, and his deity. Or his power and Godhead, as Romans 1.28 says. See? <laughs> these are two facets of God that, you, that these are beginners. This is beginner's tutelage. You have to see that God's the master and God's divine, he can't die, he can't do wrong, can't be unrighteous. No place he doesn't have absolute control and government. Amen. And if you don't see those two things, you can't go any further. Amen. These are foundational pictures, you've got to see it. And Amos sees it. <clears throat> he must first be seen as Lord God. Not, oh, God, if there is a God. You know, some people taught to pray this way. Oh, yeah. well, I've heard people say this in testimony and meetings. And I said, oh, God, if there is a God, if you're real, show yourself to me. And I felt like standing up and saying, go home or at least talk to somebody that knows something. Mm -hmm. This is not the way you pray to God. Amen. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Amen. He that cometh to God must yes. believe that he is and... 
that he's the reward that they diligently seek him. See, but that has to, people don't know this by nature. Everybody knows this, don't they? People don't know this by nature. You, you may let a child grow up without any teaching. They won't arrive at this conclusion. This has to be taught. Amen. And where it's not taught, this is serious. P t parents have to teach this. Yeah. Churches have to teach this. Yes. Anybody that's speaking for God has to teach this. Mm -hmm. And this is what God is. Lord God. There is a popular approach to God that's just academic. You just kind of study about God. I, got, I, don't, I don't like that word study. Like It's like people use it. <laughs> study to show that itself approved. It means give diligence. But I, I don't like the word study. I think I've told you that before. But it's too ac it's too academic, and you, you academics can only go so far. Maybe iron out some rough spots, but that's about it. Another approach is strictly an emotional approach. Make people scared. See, that's another. Just scare them half to death. That's another approach. You don't do this. God will let your gas leak out during the night. Yeah. Well, that, that is an approach, but this is not, <laughs> this is the right approach. All through history, there have been people who obeyed the Lord without protest mm -hmm. and without periodic lapses. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Just to name a few of them, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. It was Moses and David. Mm -hmm. Scripture accounts to each of them one sin. Yeah. Uh -huh. Moses hitting the rock, David the son of Uriah the Hittite. Mm -hmm. But none of them, neither one of them, continued. Amen. That was it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Moses never hit the rock another time. Yeah. David never did that another time. Yeah. The scripture tells you, aside from that sin, he went not aside from any of the commandments of God. All is. So there have been people who have lived consistently for God. So nobody can say, I can't. Amen. And this was all before Christ. Keep in mind that. This is before Christ. The point to be seen here, <clears throat> incidentally, could you imagine Saul, Paul saying, I've almost got this thing of persecuting the church conquered. Yeah. I just about got it. Yeah. Last week, I only imprisoned three families. But I've just about... Uh -huh. <laughs> Once Jesus got in his heart, he never again ever persecuted any believer anywhere at any time. Amen. Right. Amen. Now, that's the kind of Savior I want. I want yeah. a God that can make a man like that. That's what we want. <laughs> The point to be seen here is that this recognition of Lord God uh -huh. is integral to the new creation. Yes. Back then, uh -huh. they weren't born with this. When you're born again, you're born with the Lord God mentality. Yeah, amen. That's right. They shall all know me, and that's uh -huh. one of the, you know, this rudimentary knowledge, but you know it right off of the Lord God. You, you know it right away when you're born again. And they have a purified heart, as Acts 15, 9 says. Those who live by faith and walk by the Spirit have no difficulty receiving the Lord as Lord God. If something happens that's not pleasant, they sense the Lord came from it, they don't argue with it. They, he's, let him do whatever seems good to him. Hmm? As God gave David some choices, you remember, because he numbered Israel, and he said, do what it seems like you make the choice I don't, I don't feel competent to make the choice you make the choice so God did made the choice they had a plague for three days <laughs> where thousands of people died finally God said it's enough but stop but what I'm getting at is people that are really in tune with the Lord know he's Lord and God they that they know. They may not know why things happen in this, but they know Lord and God. Lord means eternal self-existent one. That's the kind of an academic definition. Like when people hear it, they say, what does it mean? <laughs> it means he had no beginning or ending. He always was. He always will be. That's God. 
the Lord. He's the governor, he's the ruler, supreme proprietor. He has a supreme mastery. Nobody's under him. And nobody's over him. Everybody's under him. God, see, ultimate reality is deity. He's unequaled in strength. He can, he's the creator and the redeemer. He can do anything. He's God. With God, all things are possible. Incidentally, Lord, when you read in your Bible, Lord with the capital letters, L-O-R-D, capital letters. I checked this because it was unbelievable at first, but it is so. That word is mentioned 6,471 times in the Bible. Interesting, isn't it? And only two of those times is it in the New Testament scriptures. <laughs> Why? Well, because this is born into people that are. Amen. That's right. You've heard people say, you you made him your Savior, now make him your Lord. This is just a lot of nonsense. Don't, yeah. it's a lot of nonsense. He's already made him Lord, and if he's not Lord, you're, you're Lord, you're not in. That's right. Amen. This is part of being born again. Yes. God, that's mentioned 4,081 times, 1,351 times in the New Testament scriptures. God, one God who's over all, through all, and above you all. One God, God. God, this is the God Jesus teaches you to know, 1 John 5, 20. That's that God. Oh, Lord God, so I'm addressing the Supreme Holy One. I beseech thee. In his first prayer of this chapter, Amos said the same words, except he had another word before him. He said, forgive, I beseech thee. He doesn't say that forgive here. Interesting, isn't it? And I say, I beseech thee. Beseech is the idea of urgency earnestness, fervency, do this now, see, I will tell you, the closer you get to God, the more you expect now, delays and some time and all that, this passes from your vocabulary, once you're on this side of the cross and you're drawing and you're in Christ and you're living by faith and walking in the spirit, waiting for God to do what he's promised is a very difficult thing to do, like waiting for his coming. It's very, calls for stamina, see, to do this. Yeah. I beseech thee. So he perceived, I can't like make an excuse for Israel because I know their sin's great. It was great to me. I can only imagine what it is to you. Mm -hmm. So I, I, but I beseech you now. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm pleading with you to do something earnestly. He says, yeah, and he says the same thing he said the first time. By whom shall Jacob rise? He is small. Mm -hmm. If you, if you, you talk about, uh, God had spoken about utter destruction. See, so if you utterly destroy them, and Jacob's small, like it's nothing to compare with the other nations of the world. If you wipe them out, who's going who's gonna to cause this nation to rise again? Remember, God told Moses he'd make of him a great nation. Yes. But Moses is from the wrong tribe. He wasn't from the tribe of Judah. See, holy men knew this. They don't know. How's Jacob going to have this multitudinous offspring that you promised? You promised him his, his offspring is going to be as the sand of the sea, and if you wipe him out, how's that going to be fulfilled now? Yeah. How's a star going to come out of Jacob? Yeah. Amen. Like was prophesied. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, that's powerful reasoning. Amen. This same kind of reasoning, Moses had the same thing, except yeah. he said, Look, if you destroy the people, the Egyptians are going to hear and say, you brought them out to destroy them, and you didn't have enough strength to bring them into the promised land. He knew how to reason with God. Yes, yes. This, uh, this is a good world endurance. And you think about, too, um, when we're thinking of our race, this can help you to not give up. This endurance, the Lord has this endurance because of what he's doing. And so, so if you're ever tempted to just... To give it and to give up, you can say, No, I'm going to endure because the Lord has endured a lot That's right. for this, mm -hmm. and so it's worth it to continue on. Amen. Amen. How old is this going to be fulfilled? He can make them stand, yeah. he can keep you from falling. How's that going to be fulfilled? See, powerful reasoning. Yeah. 
Now, this is the kind of thinking that I understand Paul to have had when he had a care that came on him every day. Amen. This was a distressing care. It wasn't as I have, I have these nice thoughts about the churches. That, <laughs> that's not what he meant. Yeah. Now, we're, we're early in the history of the church now. Uh -huh. We're between 50 and between 50 and 70 A.D., and already we got this earnest care for the churches. Yeah, it came on Paul daily. He saw the churches were living beneath what was, what was given to them. They hadn't laid hold of the truth of the gospel like they should. Some, and he, he just found this to them. See, they hadn't got it. Yeah, right. Early on, they hadn't got it. That's why this thought of restoring the New Testament church is a lot of hullabaloo. The church wasn't strong in the first century. Yeah. People don't realize. That's why they had all these corrective epistles. That's why they had them all. Uh -huh. There's a lot of false prophets that arose. It wasn't the epitome yeah. of things. Mm -hmm. It was still in the beginning. That's right. Which means that you, this, these things do not happen automatically. No. You have to give all diligence if you're going to make your calling election sure. See, here's, here's the way it is. That Paul, Paul knew this, but not many people beside Paul did know it, and fewer still know it now. In salvation, everything is supplied for a person to live on top of life all the time, to reign in life by righteousness. Everything required to do that is in the salvation that's in Christ Jesus. But precious few people know that, and consequently, they don't pursue it. Now, under this old covenant, there was provision for, to sacrifice for sin and repent and come to the God and ask for forgiveness, and there was provision to at least kind of get on their path again, but they didn't take advantage of it. But in Christ, now, there is no excuse for people lagging behind. There isn't any. Sometimes some of us may recognize maybe it was some of our fault that we didn't say more and reveal more. But the provision is a great salvation, and if you don't neglect it, it'll do exactly what God intended it to do. Amen. Paul cared for the churches. He also knew of their relative smallness. The church was never the dominant populace of the world not not at any time has it been it's small yet how is this going to happen the knowledge of the lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea how will that happen lord if if you come down and there isn't anybody left so this is the time to be praying for god to show mercy to spare the remnant raise up some obedidums to hide some of the peoples of the world can't get at them there's some parts of the world that christians have to be hid just like those prophets had to be hid in a cave. Huh? Yeah. He didn't say, go out there and tell Jezebel she's nothing but a false prophet. Oh, that was, it's just not the thing to do. You had to hide. Yeah, that's right. Amen. God's name is most glorified when he works with the minority and makes it glorify his name. That's right. Because if he, if he works the, with the majority, people will say, well, it's easy because the majority rules. But when God works with the yeah. minority and makes it great, that brings praise to his name. It does. Mm -hmm. But, he, but he is, it's going to be the majority. Before this world ends, God's people are going to at some time be the majority. More The children of the barren are going to be more than the children of the married. And as you all know, Isaiah 54 comes after Isaiah 53. And after 53 was said, he said, get the tent larger. Enlarge the tent and bit the stake stretched out. See, God's made provision for a host of people. And it's going to happen. But until it happens, we got to have these intercessors standing in the gap. Well, Lord, how are you going to respond to Amos now? This is the second time, the second time you told him. First time he asked you to forgive, this time he just says, don't, don't do that, don't, this fire consume them. The Lord repented for this. They are second time, second time I said this, Lord repented of this, this also, this also, oh, this also shall not be. This is a vision, this is really what I would have done if you hadn't stepped in, this would have happened, Amos. 
if you hadn't come before and made your plea, this this is what I was going to do. And we, I do understand that there's sometimes that he had told Jeremiah, don't pray. There's some things that you can't change. He told Jeremiah four times, don't pray for this people. I won't hear you and tell them I won't hear them either. So we're trying to forestall that kind of circumstance. See, that kind of circumstance can happen. Make no mistake about this. Sometimes I wonder if, we're, have it, if we haven't entered into a period like that, but I don't know as so I'm praying, mm -hmm. cease and forgive and have mercy and spare the remnant. Yeah. Have a remnant. God can rebuild with a remnant, yeah. but he's not going to have another Abraham That's right. or another Isaac or another Jacob mm -hmm. or another Judah. Not going to, <laughs> he's not going to start over that way. So we got to have this remnant. So God's always there. If you just look up remnant, you'll find all through the prophets, he mentions this remnant. Sometimes it got really pretty small. But a remnant, he can speak greatness out of a remnant. Yes, amen. So the Lord responds to the prayer of Amos, because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now here was a, here's an example. God heard Abraham's prayer and spared Lot. Genesis 19, 29, they're getting ready to destroy the city. And Scripture says, and God remembered Lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. He spared him. Yeah. For Abraham's sake, God heard Moses' prayer and spared Israel. Remember, he said, step aside. Step aside. Just, yeah, yeah. Well, let, now the people that operate by law, that's a commandment, isn't it? Yes, sir. Step aside. But there's some commandments God doesn't intend that way. Mm -hmm. Some commandments are like a test. Yeah. Moses, instead of stepping aside, he stepped up. Yeah. Said this, if you do this, the Egyptians will hear. And they'll say you couldn't bring them out and you couldn't bring them in. Yeah. I wonder if we could pray like that today. Mm -hmm. I'm inclined to think you can. Mm -hmm. Lord, if you don't strengthen your church... People are going to begin saying, which they have already, really. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, your God's not able to do it. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's powerful reasoning. With, yeah. with God, we can say it to one another, but somebody needs to say that to God. Yeah. Plead for him. God heard the prayer of Joshua, and the sun stood still. God heard the prayer of someone called the man of God. Don't even know what his name was. He's called the man of God. And Jeroboam's hand that God had dried up was restored, whole as the other. Why? Because he heard the prayer of some other man. The Lord heard the prayer of Job for his friends, and when he did, his captivity ceased. It says when he prayed for his friends, his captivity ceased. <laughs> now we're learning from all these examples. Those that something Christ said, we're learning the extent of this meaning. He said, whatsoever, uh, this is John speaking for Christ, whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are well-pleasing in his sight. Mm -hmm. Now, some people read this and they think it means you ask for something for yourself. Mm -hmm. And I don't deny that maybe that's involved, but I like to apply you ask for the remnant. Or you ask for some other soul. Yes. Or you ask for someone that lost their life, were spiritually dead. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like First John 4 says. Yeah. And God will give them life yeah. because you asked. Yeah. Amen. Whew, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's powerful stuff. Again, he said, uh, this, is his, this is the confidence that we have in him. Heaven who? In him. This is the confidence we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if, and if we know that he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know we have the petitions that we desire of him. So all you have to know is, am I in the in flow of God's will? Is the, am I praying about something God has made known he wants? Amos was. Yeah, amen. He knew God had chosen these people. He knew the Messiah was going to come to these people. See, so he's right on, he's on holy ground when he yeah, prays. Amen. That's what you want to do. You want to get into the flow of God's will. Of course, that means you have to know it, but you can. You can know it. 
the, the scriptures are pretty complete on this. Amen. Amen. You can know it, and other there's other people that can help you that know it. They'll be glad to tell you what, any area that they know that you don't. Once you're in the flow of God's will, you begin to pray within the context of thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yeah. When you get, now this is what it says. We have the petitions. Yes. We'll get what we ask for. Yeah. That's what it says. Amen. That's what, that's what Amos, Amos knows that. Uh -huh. it, I think intuitively he knew it. It hadn't been written yet, but intuitively he kind of knew this. He knew what God was doing. Now, what if you got a group of people that don't know what God's doing? See, see what a handicap that is? Yeah, that's right. It handicaps them. They can't pray as thoroughly as they could otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, learning from all these examples should alter the way we approach yeah, God. Amen. Now then the question comes, why did Amos have to pray again? He already, God told him he was going to destroy it. He prayed and he said, I, he repented, he said, this isn't going to happen. Why did he have to pray a second time? Why, why wasn't that first prayer sufficient? You do remember that when Jesus on the eve of his betrayal prayed three times, yes, yes. that if it was possible, let this cup pass from me. He prayed that three times, he prayed that th three times. I'm about to explain why this is the case. It was de why did the angel? Why did an angel have to be dispatched from heaven to strengthen him in the Garden of Gethsemane? Why couldn't he just? Why is the will of God just kind of locked in place like that? Why couldn't he just? You know, why did he have to enter into it like this? There's a reason. It's because of the divine nature. That's why and the impact of his coming sacrifice upon it. If the world's going to be saved, if salvation is going to be preached, somebody has to take away sin. Because God isn't going to forgive anybody unless it's for someone else's sake. God has forgiven you for Christ's sake. See? So this divine nature, God couldn't, uh, God couldn't forgive us unless there was a reason, a righteous reason to forgive us. Amen. Therefore, he prayed those three times. Something similar to that is found in this text. When it comes to a matter of sin in the people of God, there's more involved than like breaking the law. That's involved. It was more involved than that. Sin has an impact upon God. Yes. You can move him, according to Psalm 106.4, to abhor his own inheritance. Is that because God's fickle? <laughs> because God's righteous. Yeah. It can move him to loathe his people. Zechariah 11, 8. Because God can't, is inconsistent? No, no, because he's righteous. Yeah. Amen. I trust you can see this. He can be angry with Solomon yeah. to whom he gave all his influence because he appeared to him twice. He can hate even solemn assemblies. Amos 5.21 and be provoked to jealousy, 1 Kings 14.22 and be provoked to anger, Psalm 78.58. Hosea, moved by the Holy Spirit, said of Israel, Ephraim provoked him to anger most bitterly. God's righteous. He is not impervious to sin. And when he sees sin in his people, it has this effect upon him. It awakens this part of his nature that hates sin. And it is repulsed by iniquity. It awakens that, that part of his nature. That's why these prayers, that's why this had to be go over this again, because in between mm -hmm. the calling off of the first plague and the initiation of the second plague, Israel had agitated God all yeah. the more. Uh -huh. yeah. so he's back where he was before. Yeah. And, and God had determined that he wasn't going to just keep doing this throughout the history of the world. 
angry, someone intercedes, call it off. Angry, someone intercedes, call it off. At some point, that cycle had to stop. God wasn't going to change. If there was any change, it had to be done in men. And only God could do it, but God wouldn't do it unless it was right to do it. <laughs> you can see that, I'm sure. It was for this reason, because Israel was continuing in their sin and would keep on provoking the Lord that his indignation is just being stirred up. Now, all of us have somebody close to us that sins a lot. And from time to time, you may be tempted to kind of be tolerant and patient of it. But when it agitates you, let it let agitation do its work. Amen. And when you're in a state of agitation, pray. Yes, amen. That's, right. that's the secret. See, otherwise, otherwise your agitation will turn into bitterness, and yes. this is no good. Amen. You become bitter. Then it'll, it'll eat you up like acid. Yes, amen. So when the sin agitates you, you have this access to the throne to do something about it. Why else would God have a kingdom of kings and priests That's right. if he didn't want this to happen? That's exactly right. Yeah. Amen. See, so he told these things to the prophets so they'd step up mm -hmm. into the gap because yeah. he knew there was... Jesus came in the fullness of time. There was like a date Jesus was to enter the world. And things were getting bad, 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 bad. And unless someone stepped in, we wouldn't get to that date. I mean, this is how this is thinking as a man. This is how they thought. So they'd pray for to remember mercy and in, in wrath, remember mercy. Remember mercy for who? For the remnant. That's who you remember mercy for the remnant. Because he would, he'd destroy the other people quite often. And he repented for this also. <laughs> Some people say, well, what? I thought God never repented. It's all confused about this, you know. Why don't you just, like, believe what he said? Yeah. Stop all that foolish arguing. There are some things about he, he said he won't repent about. Some things he won't repent about. But those aren't things that are controlled from earth. Yeah. There's some category of things God does that depends on what happens down here mm -hmm. among his people. This, this is an example. This is an example right here. Yes. Yes. Something that's, that's come to me new recently is that when God repents, it's just a change of direction that's all within the context of his righteousness. That's right. Mm -hmm. It is his predominant trait, and when he repents, it doesn't mean that he turns away from a bat... Uh, how men view bad things. It's not that he turns away from that and goes back into his righteousness. He's just shifting his state of being in his righteousness. So yeah. he never departs from that. Do you have an example? God said he was going to destroy Israel. Moses postponed it. But they were destroyed. The unbelievers were, de were destroyed. Do you say... He postponed it. It's a righteous postponing. Uh -huh. there, see, there is a purpose God has. It's not an eternal purpose. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a part of it. But it this kind of purpose is what allows the people of God to enter into what He's yes, amen. enter into what He's doing. That that's what has to be uppermost in a person's mind. There is a work God is doing uh -huh. that men can't enter into, like justifying and this. They, you, but there is a work you can be co-laborers with God. You can Amen. enter in. So God's work is keep this remnant here till Jesus comes. He He has chosen not just like to mandate that. Yeah. He calls in holy men mm -hmm. to join him in this purpose. Amen. And keep, because of them, his mercy, goodness, and grace is mm -hmm. called into play. Yeah. See? Amen. You can, well, it's no need to just continue working this over, but that's that's the thing that you want to see here. Yes, amen. There's a reason why. It isn't like just like repetition. God said he would. 
prophet said don't, so he didn't. Then God said he would, and the prophet said don't, and he didn't. It's, it's not like that. That's right. yeah. It's like that whenever sin doesn't begin to diminish, it keeps God in a state of provocation. Mm -hmm. That's why he's reserved a remnant of people on earth mm -hmm. because he loves these people. That's right. And he'll listen to these people, and that's what enables him to not compromise his own character. He does this in deference to them without being unrighteous. See? This is an example of, in the, in the New, New Covenant way of saying it's grace for grace, or grace upon grace. So here we got grace in the first incident. We got grace in the second one. We got grace upon yep. Amen. grace. <laughs> I, I think I'm I'm going to end there unless I going to overwork the thing. But I sure get a lot out of this. I, I this this blesses my soul to have these glimpses of God to see how He is. Amen. It changes how you look at circumstances. Amen. Yes, brother Tony. It's a quality of God that he's let us know about his mercy so that we can appeal to his appeal mercy. To it, that's he's, good. he's working in real time and real history with real people. He's got this date that you talked that's about. Right, that's it's right. Just, this is how he's, you know, we, we know that he raises up these prophets, Jeremiah, uh -huh, pro yeah. and, and he brings these men, raises these men up to get us to this date. That's right. Mm -hmm. now, now, if a person... If a person's religion is this world-centered and they're always dealing with what's wrong here and what needs to be corrected here, they never get this view. They're not thinking of what God's working toward or what's going to be. In the end, the bride's going to have made herself ready. That's what we're, that's what we're working toward here. If people are unconverted, we want them to get converted and be part of this yes, bride that's, that's gonna right. that's made herself ready. That's what it says over right. the bride has made herself ready. Amen. Now admittedly God gave her what she needed and it was by God's grace. But she made herself ready. When that when that is your aim, you'll have a better priority of what you do, priority arrangement of what you do. It'll change where you put the emphasis. Amos, you know, he was a gatherer of sycamore fruit and a shepherd. So there's other stuff he could do that would be less turmoil. But then he knew about the Lord God. Yes, amen. <laughs> Anyone else tonight have something you'd like to add? Sister Barbara? In the beginning you mentioned and threw out sensing things in our spirit. And... It's very important that we examine those things that we're inclined to do or to yeah. say to see if it's the Lord That's good. by His Spirit provoking us That's in these good. areas. Mm -hmm. whether, it be, whether it be speaking out <coughs> for the Lord in, in the midst of people that don't know Him or whether it be a source of ministry within the body itself. Yeah. The Lord gives us these senses and these inclinations mm -hmm. to move us into the gap, as you were saying. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. Anyone else tonight? Mm -hmm. Yes, but Aaron. This, this prayer, <clears throat> Lord God, how, how we pray, how we live, how we serve each other. I mean, it, life, can, life, I think, could be pretty accurately summed up as a, a result of of how we think of God. What does a, what does a person yeah. think of God? That's mm -hmm. and, Amen. And directly related with that is how a person thinks of themselves. And yeah. they're, they're very proportionate. So it's, it's impossible for somebody ha to have the Lord God view and be basically self-driven, yeah. self-interested right. huh? right. in, in their own, their own person. That this, it, I, I think it's a lot. It should be alarming, and it is becoming more alarming to me. How uncommon it is for people to be content to view God as God. 
Mm-hmm. You got all kinds of trouble with this. I know. Oh, yeah. They don't. They don't say I have trouble with God being God, but they, in in their works. Oh yeah. That, that's their. That's mm-hmm. how they're. That's how they live. Uh-huh. Yeah. In works they deny him. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. So th- this kind of prayer, you know, and you, and you mentioned others also in Scripture. That's why these prayers are powerful. Mm-hmm. Because they have this Lord God view yeah, of, right. of, yeah. of God, uh-huh. and whether whether God like Job, whether He slay me, I will trust Him. Uh-huh. That's, a, that's a Lord God view. Yeah. Hmm. Amen. I, I heard just just recently a, a minister say that he was uh, teaching on the sovereignty of God, not knowing about a a situation in a family that they were bearing. Uh, of uh, health issues, terminal health in a, in a young child. And the mother confessed and said, not knowing anything about our situation, you have sustained me in this trial by teaching the sovereignty of God. Mm-hmm. Without knowing the sovereignty of God, mm-hmm. she Amen. told this pastor, Amen. this trial would have been too much to bear. Yeah. Amen. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Amen. I know. Yeah. Amen. I, I, I shared with you something this happened many years ago. 1958 uh, vintage year. And I had had uh, some difficulties, and so I, I had immersed myself in reading scripture. I read the scripture through 50 times a year. Listened to it and read it. And the day, I still remember the day it dawned on me, the scriptures are about God. And I couldn't remember ever preaching about God. Oh, it was a, what do you call it, epiphany? I mean, where that was my focus. I'd mentioned God, yeah, but it changed, it altered everything about me. And you see all these statements where they just leap out at you. Yeah. Does whatsoever he will on armies of heaven and heavens of the earth. I don't know. <laughs> all those texts that I just kind of, I had a certain kind of glasses on. Uh, There's a certain kind of theological yeah, glasses. Yeah, you right. put them on and you read over all the good that's stuff. Right. That's what happens, yeah. Amen. When you get those off, you think, whoa, well, you got, no wonder it says you live by every word of God. You do. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll have a closing prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for Brother Amos. Yeah, we know that he, uh, he had a lot of faith, and life was uh, difficult for him here in this world because he, of his heart for you and for your work and your people. But he was faithful, and he's a great encouragement to us. We thank you for him in Jesus' name. Amen.